Our next panel are the juries and designers for this year's American Illustration and American Photography Annuals. So Robert Newman, on your right, is moderating this panel of a mixture of American Illustration and the American Photography jurors. Uh, following on down, just very quickly, Len Small and Corey Jacobs and Chris Dixon. Wyatt Gallery is here. That's a person. And Marty Golan. And I'll, Bob, I'll let you take over. Oh, great. Thanks, you guys. Um, we've got a mix up here of, of art directors and photo editors and uh, gallery curators and photographer. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about the books, the American Illustration and American Photography book, and kind of the science that went into putting them together. And then we're going to sort of pull the curtain back and talk a little bit about um, how we work and how we work with illustrators and how we work with photographers. Uh, we solicited a bunch of photographers and illustrators for questions to ask us. And they were pretty much, we got three questions. How can I get work? How can I get more work? And how can I get paid more money? So we'll, we'll address those issues, although I think it's safe to say we don't really have the answer to that. Um, but let me start. Uh, I'm going to start actually with you, Wyatt. And um, I'm going to ask you, uh, you were in a rare position. You were a photographer judging photographs in the American Photography Book. Yeah. And I'm curious if now having done this, you have advice for people here about what they could do to get in next year's book. Yeah, it was definitely interesting to be kind of behind the scenes uh, and see the process. Uh, I would advise people to submit um, a series versus an individual image. Um, I think that the, the judges can get more of a, a full view of your work and um, we spend more time on it because there's actually more images passing in front of us. So I think um, submitting a series is the number one way to kind of stack the odds in your favor. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, really think about images that are unique to you and very bold uh, and really, like, that they're your style. You know, if someone saw these, they could say, oh, this is a Wyatt Gallery, you know? I really think that that is key. And uh, Marty, let me ask you the same question about illustration. Well, what advice do you have for people here after you've gone through this judging and you've looked at all this great work? How can they break through and get into the American Illustration book next year? Well, I think I have to agree with Wyatt. Is this on? Um, yeah, just hold it close. Hold it close, OK. Um, that the people who submitted a series of work that were, you know, you could see the body of work because when they're, you know, there were 10,000 images and we, you know, literally had three seconds to view each one and they're not in the context of where the work originally appeared. So it does need to be bold. Some people sub submitted really small images that came up on our screen really small. So then, you know, of course, you're not going to get judged as, as um, you know, people you're straining to see and it's going so quickly. So it does, the, the artwork does have to stand on its own. It can't, you know, be relying on what maybe it was originally assigned for, a headline that's going to sell it. it. You know, the art has to stand for itself. Okay, um, Chris, uh, let me ask you, after seeing all this work and seeing the thousands of illustrations, Chris judged the American Illustration book, um, what stood out for you in terms of trends, you know, what, what seems like it's happening right now? Um, well, I don't. For me, the biggest part of the experience was the the how much variety there was, and then with the mix of judges, you know, people are judging and responding to what you know they like and what they feel in their gut at that moment. And it was really varied because you everyone has their own taste and everyone has their own um, you know what they're bringing that day. And I found that the most um, there wasn't one trend for me anyway. I just saw all the stuff that I love, and I was picking it and, uh, and getting excited. Other people found other things completely different that I wouldn't be excited about. But that's where we got the whole mix. And I think, you know, certain things end up standing out. I find that the New Yorker covers, because they're going to hit on sort of a moment right now or a topical moment or a news moment. So those always sort of popped out and everyone responded to those. Um, and uh, other than that, I think it was sort of the whole mix that I've seen for years and years and years where you get everything that's beautiful and sort of magical and there's things that are really hard hitting and political and bold and graphic, so it was all great. Uh, Corey, let me ask you the same question about the photographs. If, as you judged, you felt like, oh, this is the year of, 
you know, black and white, or this is the year of Instagram photos. Was there, was there, were there any trends, or was there anything that really stood out as sort of being particularly magical this year? Well, I think one of the most interesting things about these books, and I have many of them on my bookshelf, is that it does give you a snapshot of the era, and that speaks to the news of the era, the aesthetic. Obviously, because there's so many different categories, um, you know, you have a little bit of everything. Obviously, these books are often pretty um, skewed toward portraiture and journalism, I think. Um, there is still life. There's probably less fashion. Um, that would be the, the kind of smallest category, I think, that's represented. Um, but photographically, I think, you know, things do feel looser to me than they have. There is um, a lot of the portraiture is looser than if you looked at, I think, in American photography 10 years ago. Um, kind of evidence in the Christopher Anderson pictures you see that are commissioned um, by New York Magazine. And, and then there are the trends that you see based on subject matter. So one thing that's interesting is you have Chris Christie, and you see him photographed by you know, three different people. Obviously, it was a, an interesting year for him. Um, and, and then you see, from a couple different vantage points, um, you know, the death of Nelson Mandela and how that was represented photographically. And then you have um, Jillian Laub shooting a 12-year-old transgender girl for People magazine, which again is something we wouldn't have seen 10 years ago. So, yeah. Uh, I want to come back to that point about um, things feeling dated. But uh, first, we're going to have Len talk a little bit about creating and designing the actual American Illustration book. If, if you guys can just pass it down. Oh, sure. Um, by the way, if you're not familiar with Len's magazine, Nautilus, um, I really recommend you check it out. It's this amazing science magazine with uh, really one of the best illustration showcases that you probably haven't seen, and it's well worth seeing. And, and while we're on the subject, if you haven't seen Reader's Digest lately, I highly recommend you look at that because that is one of the most spectacular venues right now, also for illustration. It's well worth checking out. And, and to go back to Dan's point before, there are plenty of magazines out there that you don't know about that are well worth checking out, whether you're a photographer or an illustrator, to see if you can do work. I'm sorry. Yeah, spend times on the on your little independent bookshelf. Uh, check out those those uh, magazines that have the. 10K or less uh, <laughs> circulation, like Nautilus. Um, and uh, yeah, but to talk about the book, you, you know, uh, it's, fun it's funny you mentioned Nautilus is a um, is primarily an online uh, publication. And uh, you know, as a as an online designer, you know, my first instinct is to have something that at least ha has some sensation that you will not experience online. Uh, that's you know, w we've kind of turned the tables on our experience with taking in images and artwork, and so to have something that's uh, uh, just tactile, has um, some treats in it that feels physical that you want to touch. Um, and uh, so uh, I should say that this was a collaboration with a designer um, named Esther Wu, who was um, uh, worked at uh, Spotco for a long time, and so had a lot of, kind of worked with a lot of illustrators through theater, and uh, so we, I, I feel like she was the perfect person to kind of give the, the drama that we wanted for the book. And, uh, and uh, of course, also not to repeat uh, previous years and, and, and to feel like you're uh, touching on something that's happened this year. Um, so uh, and for me, uh, also, uh, the illustrator was, was so important to the decision. And in fact, I don't think we even cracked, uh, you know, uh, into the design at all until we, we knew who we were going to ask. Could you, uh, Len, could you explain who the cover illustrator is Absolutely, yeah. and how you sort of decided to assign this particular person? Uh, the illustrator is, and I, I always hope I pronounce this right, Daehyun Kim um, from Seoul. And he's here in New York. I don't know if he's here today, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, shine a spotlight him, at him at the party. Uh, and. Um, I have to actually thank Yuko Shimizu, who, is, uh, who I was talking to at the Society uh, uh, show, and, and she said, you, you have to look at this guy. And you know, sometimes that's the best thing, right, to, to get uh, you know, a little uh, worm in your ear uh, from someone you trust. And, and I started looking at Dehun's work online, and he goes by the name Munasi. And he just, he, it, it was wonderful to see someone who was so specific about his uh, aesthetic and ideas, and yet felt felt so universal uh, and and emotional, 
And so um, when we approached him, he was tickled. He was like, how did you find me, kind of, you know, and uh, wonderful to work with and always um, modest, And uh, even though he actually did two pieces for us because there's a in, in the hidden interior. Voila. I don't know if you can see that. And we and we, we kept on flip flopping about which one should be the cover, but but that was uh, exciting. So there you go. So. You know the the funny thing about the two books this year is I I only met Len br very briefly a, a few months ago. We had nothing to do with each other while we were working on these books, and yet uh, unbeknownst to each other, we both did black and white covers for American photography and American illustration, and. <laughs> <laughs> did a, a flip cover as well. Oh, oh. Like, what are the odds? Let, let's, let's go on. And, and, the, uh, <laughs> and, and, and the black and, cloth and, and blind and boss. Cloth. And, <laughs> and uh, lack of color inside. Yeah. This cover, by the way, is by a photographer named David Buto. And um, I want to just tell you guys a little bit about how we came to this. Um, and, and of course, as with every book, there's a great editor involved in this, which was Mark. Uh, you know, who, Mark Heflin, who was really the editor and was responsible for a lot of the inspiration and, and a lot of the guidance that we got. But we decided we wanted to do this year a very minimal, very stripped down uh, American photography book. And we wanted to do something with photojournalism on the cover because a lot of the past covers have been um, more fashion and more stylized and, and not quite as, from my perspective, direct. The problem being that most of the photojournalism in the book is pretty gruesome and pretty, you know, it's, it's artful, but it's not necessarily the kind of thing you want to have on a cover. And we were really fortunate to find these photographs from Nelson Mandela's uh, funeral where there was a great exuberance in the photograph. This was really great. And so, you know, we had what we thought was a great documented photo, um, very classic stylized thing. Um, but it was kind of upbeat and kind of happy, and we thought that was really good. It was nice joy and pain. Yeah, exactly. Now, that's enough about the book. We've done our job to sell you the book, so <laughs> let's move on. Um, the, really, the big question people wanted to know is how do the people on stage here find uh, illustrators? How do they find photographers? Or the flip, how do photographers and illustrators find you? So let me ask a few of you. Let me actually start with you, Chris. Um, how do you find uh, illustrators at Vanity Fair? Yeah, I've met a little bit of a zine called Vanity Fair. If you want to check it out on the... I'm just kidding. The, uh, what do we do for... You know, we're... Um, what's interesting, because I came to Vanity Fair just three years ago. There's been a long history there of uh, certain staff working there. A lot of it's driven, you know, the, by the taste of the editor. You mentioned the editor behind these things, but that drives a lot of the decisions that we make. And our editor is passionate about... Uh, Illustration, so he always rips things out and brings them to me all the time for people to use. He's got certain tastes um, that we work with on him, so we collaborate on all those things. But we basically just pull things. All the staff get together, and we all will pull things every week that we've seen in different magazines, newspapers from around the world. Um, we try to source people in Europe and different places just to get a different flavor. And uh, you know, on the flip side, we do that. On the other side, there's people that have been with the magazine for years and years and years that have um, a tradition and they're part of the brand. So we work with them and we try to just keep evolving their styles. But we also meet with people that come in um, and we have great relationships with people that work in. Um, and they come see us and we try to use them as much as we can. And Corey, how about you? you have a, a, you're in a little different position. Uh, Corey is a former magazine photo editor, um, but now you're a curator at Hermes. How do you find talent? Well, I still do have one foot editing um, editing magazines as well. So I, for me, I like to, um, you know, I go to all the art fairs. I go to APAD in New York. I generally go to Perry Photo. I think photo festivals are a great place. Um, Arl in particular. Um, their book award is amazing. Every book that's published, kind of photography book around the world over the course of the year is la laid out on many, many tables. And you just, you find so many people you've never heard of. Um, and then, and then there are places like Lightbox, you know, Times um, Photography Blog, which I think is one of the best. Um, and then there are the more traditional routes, which are people just write you, you know, they reach out to you, they like what you're doing, and so. 
And hey, Bob, one second. I'm, I'm going to cue the images. We would use the uh, two uh, slideshows. We're going to, sh as they're speaking, we're going to show you pictures <laughs> from the books. Uh, Marty, let me ask you. Let me flip this a little bit. What should an illustrator do to get into Reader's Digest? Well, I'll start by saying I think these contests really matter because we do look at these books. I keep them on my shelf. Um, the, the Society of Illustrators contests, even the book ones, the advertising. It, you know, even though I'm editorial, I'm looking at all of that. And you know, if you win, if you you know, if your work has been selected for one of those, you know, it's then I'm going to your website. I'm going to check it out. Um, you know, sometimes it's it can be frustrating because the one that's in the book, then you go to the website and nothing matches up. Um, so, you know, having um, an up-to-date website can help, too, because sometimes you see the work and you want to see it right away, and I think some people are slow to get it up onto their sites. But I do definitely hire from award-winning, you know, people sending in, you know, I hired an illustrator in England this week uh, who sent me what probably is like spam email, but it was a beautiful piece, and I loved it, and hired, you know, we ended up hiring her right away. So. I, and even traditional mail, we still, you know, not that many people do that anymore, and I hang on to those. Or I get it, and then I go right to the site and bookmark the site under, you know, a category that is something that I know I'll need in the future. All right, this is a question for Wyatt. The, really, the number one question I get from illustrators and photographers is, should I send a postcard? Do you still send postcards? Or have you ever, I should ask you, because you're younger, have you ever sent a postcard? I, I wanted to ask the same question. <laughs> should we still send postcards? I haven't sent a postcard for years. I used to, um, and it worked at times. Uh, but I wonder, too, you know, some places don't accept mail. Some places welcome it. I really don't know anymore. But for me, it's... I get my jobs or exhibitions uh, mostly through relationship building and connecting with people and uh, following up and just staying present in their mind. So like an email newsletter or um, you know, an email just reaching out saying, hey, I'm in the city, can I, can I show you some new work? I, I really think it's all about uh, staying in touch with people and building a long-term relationship versus just, hey, give me a job. Mm -hmm. You know. let, let me ask you guys in the audience, how many of you still send out cards? It's a lot. How many of you have gotten work from sending out cards? It's not bad. All right, this next question is for Len. Um, how did you learn to be an art director? And, and what, 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 what gives you the right to tell these guys you know, what to do? Well, <laughs> that's a good question, Bob. Um, my, uh, the first uh, opportunity I had to be an editorial art director, uh, I was working at a nonprofit uh, online magazine. And uh, most of our stuff was sourced by, you know, the cheapest available uh, way we could get an image, mostly photography. Um, and on occasion, I could, I could reach into my budget, and I would get just enough money, and I would go on the doorstep of an illustrator that I liked um, and beg and plead, which is funny to hear, right? Um, but, you know, when, you, when you're starting out, and you, sometimes you're actually on the other end of the fence where you're like, I really just want an illustration. And, and I think my experience there was actually liberating because I would be like, listen, I just want to work with you. This is the budget we have. Do whatever you want. <laughs> just, just give me an illustration because we really want to make this work. So, um, so as I started to do that and and let illustrators kind of do their work, I, I actually found it um, a way uh, to uh, start the process that that kind of worked for me. And um, kind of knowing that like this is this is where I wanted to be, and this person is going to take me there eventually. And everything else that I'm doing is just kind of nudging them the right direction, keeping them on track. Uh, Corey, let me take this question and just take it one step further. How do you keep yourself fresh in terms of looking at talent and you know, kind of keep not fall into a rut as a curator or a photo editor? I think just looking at stuff as often as you can. I mean, it's pretty simplistic, but I think um, 
I mean, I think falling into a rut is one thing, and I think developing what you believe to be kind of your taste and your point of view on the world is another. Um, they could cross over a little bit, but um, I think it's, you know, it's a little bit what, um, what Wyatt was saying. It's about keeping, keeping relationships going and meeting new people all the time. And, and um, I think particularly in the age of um, our, you know, our digital world, it's a lot easier not to meet with people because you can, you can go on the website, you can get a very quick overview of the work. Um, but ultimately, kind of the relationship I'd have with somebody building a show or on an assignment or a commercial job, all of that is so much more enhanced by actually just meeting with people, <laughs> um, <coughs> which I think is rare and rare. And uh, this next question is for Chris. Um, what do you look for when you're trying to find a, you know, a, an illustration or a photograph that'll just be perfect for you? Um, what is it that you know, really satisfies you? What is it that, that you're trying to get? The, uh, you know, but a quick thing on the postcards, by the way, I was thinking about postcards, getting all that stuff, and then I was th recently, because I got some nice ones, and I was thinking about where I f see most people's work re more recently, which, um, but I find a lot of them if I'm on my phone or if I'm on Facebook or a program like that or Instagram, and someone will post something. I, I find I've been stumbling across a lot of people that way. You'll go to a gallery or though someone will write a blog post. I think Brian Ray wrote something recently about a show he did, and California sort of end up on a link and another link and then you find someone's work that way So there's sort of these whole other avenues when you're just clicking through on your phone or on your computer anyway, just to answer that question again um, We uh, I think I don't know. It's hard to answer that question. It's also um, Assignment based or on that particular assignment for us And so if we have an illustration, it's it becomes very narrow in some ways We don't do a ton of illustration of any first so there's smaller stuff But what happens is something will come in I guess this is indicative in the industry, but it's, it ends up being really last minute. You have a portrait, someone was supposed to be photographed, they weren't, and it's in the feature well, and they say, we need a full page illustration of a political figure or you know, Tony Blair or something like that. And it ends up being last minute a lot of the time, and so a lot of it, it just becomes luck, what's nearby, who have you seen recently? You, know, you don't want to use the same people over and over again. Um, and so it just becomes focused on that assignment. So it's actually what I try to do is keep any references or inspiration that I've had recently just always on hand or up on a board in my office nearby so I can just quickly look at it? Because a lot of times you think you're going to have a lot more time. And when I worked in weeklies, it was even worse, as you know. But you have hours to figure out who to assign to. And so it's just nice to have everything around you. So we sort of surround ourselves with, with work and then when we assign to it. And then when you're at, once it's coming in to assign, you know, you just work through the sketches. And um, eventually, I mean, there's a lot of people to sort of uh, please with it. So you have to go through and present it. and get everyone's feedback, and then suddenly it all just clicks for us, so. Now, Wyatt, uh, as a photographer, what is it that you wish art directors and photo editors would do better? Yeah. Um, not anyone, not get anyone us more here money. on stage, of course. Pay us more. <laughs> Pay more. <laughs> uh, give us more work. Um, but in terms of the work process, you know, what would get better, what would get better work out of you, or what would make your life uh, I think the best better. jobs that I've had, and I, I kind of made a conscious decision years, a couple years ago to focus more on my own artwork than commercial work. So most of the commercial jobs I get now, it's because there's a, a crossover of my personal work is right for their assignment. Or, you know, so that it's really a great mesh. Um, and to me, that's always the best. You know, that's the ideal situation. Um, and I think that really creates the best outcome. But I think it's also about trust. I have to trust them, and they have to trust me that we're both going to do what we do best. So, Marty, the flip of this is, you know, you've worked at Reader's Digest. You've worked at plenty of magazines. What, when you were coming up, or even you know now, what have you learned from working with illustrators? Was there anything that anybody, was there any moment where you, you know, maybe did an assignment and you were like, oh, well, that's how, you, you know, thanks for telling me that. Do, do you know what I mean? That's kind of a tough one, but um, I think I have learned to, you know, try to lead the illustrator with, like, if I've seen a piece and, you know, we always have to sell it to our editors, we have to, you know, show samples and, you know, 
sometimes people's style, do, you know, they does go down different paths. So, you know, being able to say, you know, I want to go in that direction, something in that palette, um, you know, just to be, to, so that, you know, because we do have people to please on the other end and we don't want it to be a, a bust in the end, um, which does happen. Now, here's a tough question and anyone can answer it or you can all avoid it. Um, this was a, a very well-known illustrator sent this into us. Why have illustration rates not gone up in like the last 20 years at magazines? Um, I mean, I was, working at, I was working at, yeah, I was working at Entertainment Weekly. I was the design director in like 1994 and we were paying more then than people are paying now. I mean, what is that all about? And can you guys do anything about that? <laughs> uh, <laughs> one, one, oh, sorry. I just wanted to say one humorous note is that I was an intern at Entertainment Weekly while you were there uh, in college. So, I mean, I think it also says something about how many years we're all in the business. Things take longer than you think, and you have to stick in it one way or the other, whatever the rates you've, are. You've aged very well. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Isn't, you too. And with too. photography, too, the... the, um, the I don't commission the photography directly, but I know that the four or five hundred dollar day rate. I've been hearing the same thing when I was uh, when at the freelancing in the Times Magazine 12, 14 years ago. It was well, we pay four hundred a day, five hundred a day for photography, and I just heard someone the other day say that oh, the day rate's four hundred. So that's exactly the same thing. Damn those people! Yeah, I, it's only speculation. I mean, I feel it, it has to be just the you know that you've got stock, you've got accessibility. I mean, if you think about the Flickr world, for example, where, where you've got, you know, people are accessing photographs sometimes for free of fantastic photographs. Uh, and, you know, I, you know, what, how can you compete with free? You know, that's, that's always the challenge. And I don't, I don't think that's fair, but I, I, I think that that's what happens on our side, which is, you know, the other side of the coin, which, which we don't like to show you, which is how our directors kind of deal with you know, editorial and the business end and, and try to get you the best they can. I, I mean, I certainly, you know, want, I, you know, you are the advocate for your artists as well. And, and I'm always interested to know what's fair and, and reasonable. Um, so I hope that we will try to be that way as much as we can. And I can, I can say, I probably shouldn't, but you should always push back on the price because a lot of times we have a built-in, you know, um, I mean, our editors are always wanting it for less and less. I mean, I, even at Reader's Digest, our budgets have been reduced over the last, you know, five years. But, you know, sometimes we have room and particularly somebody who's more established or somebody who, you know, we respect a lot, you know, it's not a straight amount, you know. I also think it's just, it's about... You know, we're all dancing around the fact that publishing is, a, you know, is a changing field, <laughs> um, to say the least. And um, the economic structure of magazines is, you know, is no longer the same. So I do think it's strange, and I've always thought it's strange that rates haven't changed. Magazines were making more money; rates stayed the same because nobody tried to change it. And the art departments only have so much power; they're not setting the the fee structures, well, they're setting the fee structures, but not the overall budget. And um, and now they're not making any money, so it's, it's impossible for them to change. And I think what's interesting now is, you know, this kind of new trend of magazines being published by, by retailers. And I think rates, I, I think there's going to be a lot of change in rate structure as it relates to things not being purely editorial or purely commercial, but some hybrid. And, um, you know, it always seemed terribly unfair that a photographer can make $15,000 a day doing, you know, an ad for, you know, a cosmetic company and then 350 for Vogue. I mean, that's, that's their day rate, you know. <laughs> now, let, let, let me ask each of you, um, we'll just go right down the, down the row. Where do you think the most dynamic places right now in in illustration and photography where's what's the most happening place and if you were you know recommending to somebody in the audience yeah you should get your work here i don't mean necessarily a specific place although that's okay uh toronto 
<laughs> I don't know. For some reason, I keep on. I don't know. It could be a city. I meant more like what I, I, <laughs> venue. But. I, I jest. I jest. Um, uh, I think that um, yeah. I, again, I, I would have to agree with uh, uh, Chris on this. Like Facebook, uh, social media has got to be the place. Uh, you know, and and it's also because you get a lot of stuff secondhand when you when you are following or listening to an artist that you admire, and then they say you know something about someone that they like. That's that's uh, just that right. That's just like a recommendation, right? So you're you're already halfway there. Um, so I, I think w it's been awesome to watch the way that, uh, especially when I watch illustrators kind of on on Twitter, and they're just they're just following each other and they're following each other's work, and it's so supportive and great. And I think that really uh, builds equity, and uh, it's great to see that. Yeah, there's this thing called Instagram. <laughs> you may have heard of it. Um, I don't think there is, there, there obviously isn't one place, but um, a lot of people look at Instagram now in so many different worlds. Um, and you do kind of go down a rabbit hole of like, if you like this, then you'll like that. Um, I also love Aperture. I think it's a great place for photography, kind of all around. Chris? Um, yeah, I mean, it's sort of related to that, but I keep thinking about your question about where you find things too, and I think, um, I find that if there's I um, what I've when I stumble across things it seems uh, I try I like it's exciting to grab things out of the magazine context and bring them in, so it seems like a lot of commissions come from um, people doing uh, whether it's personal projects or art projects or and then they sort of promote them or write about them and you see them because I s I know um, you'll see people do a wall mural and then you'll use them for something else and I think. Um, but I do find that it always ends up being on my phone where I see all this stuff recently. So maybe it's my phone. That's my answer, my phone. That's good. Yeah. That's good. And West 38th Street is good is right now. It's hot. <laughs> what? Yeah, I was going to say Instagram and my phone as well. Um, I hate being on my computer now, and I travel practically constantly. I love shooting with my phone and uploading it to Instagram and bypassing the whole computer part of it. Uh, apps to, to process the image right on the phone. I think it's great. Um, and in the past, recently, you know, we've seen uh, the cover of Time magazine was an iPhone photo for Hurricane Sandy. Um, so I think that there is beginning to be this crossover of an amateur tool into a professional tool. Uh, and, then, and then Instagram being like a, a gallery uh, platform to, to, to look at images and for me to publish my own images. I'd say Draugr, too. I mean, I, and a lot of that I, I do end up going from Instagram or from Facebook. Somebody will post something, and it's, you know, as an art director, I love going there and seeing the process and seeing the rejected sketches and, you know, because it's something that we go through all the time. Sometimes the best one is the one that doesn't get picked. But, um, you know, I think blogging about your stuff, um, just get it out there so that, you know, because not all of us can see plan sponsor or whatever it is that does great work, by the way, um, great illustration work. Um, you know, I don't actually see that publication. So, but I've seen, you know, the process of how a lot of work has gotten in there. I want to go down the row one more time and have you guys talk about what skill set right now do you think is real, would be really great if you were an illustrator or a photographer? Besides, obviously, being a great photographer and a great illustrator, what else do they need to develop? Uh, uh, adaptability, certainly. It's, it's, you know, there's so much cross-platform work these days. If you are an illustrator, I'll just say illustrator, that you can, you can take uh, your work into animation uh, and then still deliver a wonderful, you know, uh, high-res file for your for the print uh, edition. That's, that's really uh, where I see the skills. Uh, you know, being able to be modular with your work. So it, it could, because there's so many formats now, uh, and uh, that, that's what I see as a great skill. It's hard to choose. Um, Tough charm. <laughs> <laughs> it helps. Um, and originality. Um, the, yeah, we've had, we've had people recently do great illustrations for us and then, um, they've documented, uh, Andre, and I can never pronounce his last name, Andre, George knows how to pronounce his name, Andre Carrillo, yeah, 
he did a beautiful f spread illustration for us, and then he did just sent in un you know um, unprovoked a, f a thirty second film of him. Over, you know the time sort of time lapse, but more than a time lapse. You know, image of his face and nice beautiful pan. He had music on it, and it was sort of from sketch phase all the way to final phase that he did of the thing. So we put that on the website, and then we end up using it. Um, another thing, we had a conference a few weeks ago in San Francisco. And Graydon said, get Andre to do another video of him drawing uh, you know, all these famous Silicon Valley characters. So it, it played this huge screen. We did, he redid it again for that. And so I think you know, a lot of that is based on an earlier question too, just any self-initiated projects that spread around and they end up spreading through social media and you just see them, someone does a wall mural or someone draws a car and then those things sort of work their way back into assignments. So if you're just constantly doing um, projects, I know you need the time, but um, yes and charm? Um, I would say perseverance, confidence, while remaining humble. Um, yeah, charm. Networking, relationship building, and everyone in this room should definitely read Stephen Pressfield's two books. One's called Going Pro and the other is about resistance. I find they're just key to for an artist to do the work we need to do and not let fear get in our way. Okay. Yeah, it's, you guys kind of covered it all. <laughs> well, okay, you know what? I'll ask you a separate, a different question. I'll make it easier on you. Five years from now, what do you think will be different about, you know, if we were sitting up here five years from now, what, what will we be saying? Well, I hope there's more the movement, like moving uh, illustrations. Um, I'm, I'm still not quite sure how they, where they live exactly. I mean, we do them in our digital editions and stuff, but I do think um, even if it's just a small thing, you know, like a little tiny gift where something moves, um, I'm kind of hopeful that we'll see a lot more of that. Do you think you'll be, that uh, print magazines will still be around in five years? Oh, I think definitely. Um, maybe not as many. <laughs> Uh, why? What do you think? Five years from now, what would you be saying on stage here about the just the state of photography? That's a great question. Uh, I definitely think magazines will be around. Sure. Um, I think there's a lot more video in motion now than photography in terms of advertising. So that's something to be aware of for photographers. Uh, but I think we all have to get creative how to stay afloat, how to stay in business. Um, and I think it's important that we all focus first on like what is our dream job what's our dream position what's the work we really want to do and when we focus on that I think other things kind of fall into place uh, but I think um, the iPhone is going to be a huge shift uh, I don't know I don't want to carry around my DSLR anymore personally so <laughs> Whatever we can do to get to that place where I can just shoot with my phone and print like 40 by 50 prints, that's where I'd like to be. Yeah. Chris, we were talking before about, <clears throat> or Corey was talking about things getting dated. And you know, it's true that if you go back and look at the photography annuals and the illustration annuals from 10, 15 years ago, you're like, oh my gosh, this stuff is so dusty. Um, do you think that's being accelerated? Do you think um, you know, styles are changing so quickly that's, that, that people really have to kind of run ahead of themselves to stay in vogue, if that makes sense? Um, I'm not sure. I find, I don't know that I really look at it that way. I tend to see, I mean, good illustrators will keep, they evolve their style and they will, you know, if they're smart and, and they do a good job for the assignment, it always it sort of rises above that. I think, you know, you can look back on it 10 years from now and you see broadly there'll be certain styles. But I don't know. I mean, I think it would be hard for anyone to second guess themselves and try to like, do something different in their style in order to become contemporary. I think that would just sort of end up backfiring on them in a way because it's it wouldn't be conducive to doing something creative. So I mean, you just have to obviously do what's from your gut and what your style is, and um, you know, hope that it's uh, in vogue at the moment. Corey, let me ask. Since you brought it up originally, let me ask you about uh, photography. Um, is you know, is there? What, what's today's cross-processing? Let me put it that way. <laughs> For those who are, which is probably a lot of you, too young to remember this, like, I don't know when cross-processing was, like Nine, the late mid 80s, mid-90s. You know, everyone, every magazine was running these cross-processed photographs. Be people made whole careers on it. And now, if you did that, you'd, that, that would be the last assignment you'd get. 
<laughs> it might be cool, right? Yeah. Right. Well, you it's know, kind of like Richard, acid wash jeans. Right. They never made it back. Richard didn't, Turley. It didn't. But <laughs> Bloomberg Business Week, Richard Turley would have done cross processing, you know. <laughs> I mean, but to go back, I don't think, you know, I don't, looking back at an old edition, I, I don't think they, they look dusty, Mark. Um, but I do think it's fun to look at them and figure out what becomes timeless and what looks dated. And what's, what's the difference? I actually was going, my husband and I were going through our whole bookshelf and we were pulling things down. It was like something that was made 15 years ago can just look just as good today. And some things get, have, feel dated. And I think it has to do with when you, attach yourself too strongly to a trend, so cross-processing being one. Um, I mean, today's cross-processing, I think, to some degree, my first instinct is to say, you know, iPhone pictures, um, Instagram, like that's gonna be something that looks, the kind of square format is gonna be something that in five years, like, it will change. And that, that kind of square format thing, I think, will, and the filters, because we, you know, that is kind of a version of cross-processing all the filters that people slap on. Vignetting. Um, yes. Um, that said, you know, I love the iPhone, and the new iPhones have, you know, the new fanciest camera ever. I think they'll obviously, and there already has been to some degree, the response to that is to create photography that is not as sharp and does feel more like film. And that speaks to a little bit of the trend that you see in the book to some degree with photographers like Pari and Chris Anderson. and and you know, they can shoot digitally too, they shoot both, but um, a reaction to the crystal clear, like if you watch the Apple keynote that just happened and they're talking about the cameras in the six and the six plus, which everybody's obsessed with, they are so crystal clear and the new 5K retina screens, I mean, everything is so, so sharp that I think people are gonna start reacting to that visually. It seems like when you talk about photography, so much is about the technology these days. Uh, so, Len, this is a question for you. Illustration, is that also the case? Um, y you know, is, do you feel like it's dominated right now by changing technology? I, I see trends. Uh, I mean, yes, uh, on the topic of trends, I, I certainly see how uh, it's clear how digital uh, imaging has, has gone into process for so many artists, and and it will be. A, I think time will tell how it how it holds up. I, I think for you know one of the concerns that's been expressed here, which is like short timelines and and being able to deliver work quickly. It's it's such a wonderful tool. I I can I imagine for illustrators to be able to say, well, I'll get it into my scanner. I'll I'll do my work, and then I can get it you know get it to uh, the art director in time. Uh, so so for that, you know, I'm I'm happy. Uh, how it how it lasts is a different. I don't know if that, I'm answering your question, but uh, yeah. Uh, okay, I don't about, we have about five minutes. Okay, we got two quick last questions, um, and we can just go down the row. Um, do you have a photo or an illustration hero, and why? In Twenty-five words or less. Starting here. Starting you, yeah. yeah. Uh, I hope he's not here. Uh, I. I've really enjoyed uh, working and getting to know Steve Brodner, um, who is um, just a fantastic illustrator and all-around guy. Talk about charm, uh, you know. Uh, and uh, man, I feel like when Occupy Wall Street was happening, he called me like on his bicycle, like I'm going to do some sketching, and he, would you be interested in this? And I'm like, oh god, this guy's great. Uh, and I just. <laughs> And and uh, and and being a, being a comrade, being being a peer, even with someone who I feel like I could, I thought I could never know, but yet is is so down to earth and and uh, and just delivers unbelievable work. So that would. I was going to choose somebody dead, but I think it's more interesting to choose somebody that's living. Um, so Victoria Sambonaris, I'd say I I I think you know people who are who are obsessed, I, those are the people that I'm really drawn to that can't do anything other than, than what they're doing. So she's somebody to look for that fits that description. Chris? Um, well, I guess on the theme of uh, longevity and, and technology, the, and it's probably an easy answer, but Christoph Niemann, I find, because I keep seeing on my phone now, every time I go on my phone, he's got some little thing, there's a squirrel you know, banging a walnut and it's animated on my phone, and then I remember 15 years ago at being at the Times Magazine, and he was doing all these great full-page things there for Janet Froelich, and they were amazing and simple and clever, and you know, that's, you know, he just maintains simple, smart work, so that's my answer. Uh, 
Uh, I'd say my good friend Ben Lowy, photographer, um, I feel like he's constantly trying something. He's so innovative and reinventing himself. He uses an iPhone constantly, but is great with a real camera, too, and has shot wars and travels. And then, you know, he has two kids and a family and juggling that. And I find that he also has just an amazing, positive mindset and outlook throughout this journey. Uh, so I really admire him for that. Well, I was going to say Christoph Neiman, uh, <laughs> a very easy one, but if I had to pick someone else, uh, I think right now I'd say Noma Barr. Um, he, does a, he does a regular column for me, which is a really small thing, and you know his concepts are just unbelievable, and even for uh, like a little small thing that he does every month, he gives me like 14 different versions. Um, and, you know, just the simplicity, which I think kind of goes back to the trends. I, I do think during the judging, I noticed that it seemed like things were really busy or really simple. And he's definitely in the really simple category. I think what's interesting about all the people that you guys chose is they're, they're all, they've, they're constantly changing and they're constantly developing their styles and the sort of the mediums they work in and, and their approaches. And they're not one-dimensional. You know, they're really multi-dimensional and multi-platform oriented. And I think it's interesting that you guys all picked people like that. Well, I'm friends or follow a lot of artists, and then I see who posts on them, and then you know, you do tend to kind of it snowballs. That's yet yeah, cascades. Yeah, yeah. I'd say it's a combination. I mean, you've you've got your 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 artists and photographers you follow, but then there's I, I, I'm, things like The Fox is Black or uh, This Isn't Happiness, um, Illustration Age is great, uh, you know, Aperture actually is wonderful. Um, those are those are uh, uh, places, and, and, they're, and they're giving you new names and new faces that, you know, new images you haven't seen. I would think it would have to be personally because you know the way it's happened so fast. The way we judge, uh, you know, the, the way this was judged. You know, you get you just look at something and you get, you know, and I think that's why you get such a wide range because everything's going to affect people differently. So, um, I mean, I know my personal taste was, was sort of drove everything uh, that I reacted to. First of all, I disagree that you can't charm people on email, but. Um, I think in this, in our era, I always think it's really strange when, when, when people don't, you know, if emails are a major form of communication and you're not writing people letters, that they should kind of feel more like a letter. So I think that you can be charming and you can certainly be charmless in an email when, you know, not necessarily an artist writing to me, but just in any kind of business sense. Um, and just also to clarify, since I started the, the, um, the charm train here, um, <laughs> Bob said, you know, other than the fact that they're obviously excellent artists. So that's, you know, they have to create great work to begin with. That was kind of number two. But, um, but I do think you can get it across in, in a letter and, you know, in an email, which you think of as a letter, um, by making it personal saying why you think your work connects to the person you're sending it to um, and what they do and to reference other work that they've done so that you, as the recipient, have an understanding that the person is sending it to you um, has, a, has a good reason for it um, and sees a connection. I think that often will grab people because it's not, it's not very common to do that. So. Yeah, I'd love to agree with that. I mean, I think you, you re we really have to be aware of what these people are doing instead of just saying, look at my work, you know? I have to know what they're working on, what they're interested in, and yeah, reference that, um, and, and not ask them for too much. Um, I'm good friends with some gallerists, and they always tell me if, if, if someone emails them saying, can you give me your feedback on this work? Uh, no. I don't have time to give you my feedback, is what they're going to say. So, but if you say, hey, I just want to make you aware of this work I'm doing, and there's no pressure, and they don't feel like you expect something, I think that goes uh, much further. So just make them aware of things. I, 
I, I think it's there. I think I think it's now. Yeah, I, absolutely. Um, I, I yeah. I think the question is, it, it, you know, are are illustrations going into motion for for all the the digital platforms? And uh, I mean, yes. I think in five years. It'll be surprising when people aren't animating. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, hopefully that that's not the case. But um, I, I do think that, y yes, I, it, it's a third dimension. It's, it's a way of enhancing a story um, that, that uh, you know, before it had to be done sequentially through the page turn, um, you know, and now we have an opportunity to, to have this, this whole, uh, you know, single image uh, that can animate and talk to the audience. So that's, yeah, absolutely. And that's a great segue because our next panel is Artists Moving Into Motion. Yeah. <laughs>